Let's take a look at an example now. Take a minute to pause the video and read the problem first. The problem is asking us to calculate a confidence interval and then also to interpret it for our manager who is not sure what a confidence interval is. We are given 12 viscosity values from consecutive batches and asked to find the confidence interval for the true process mean, the true viscosity. From the central limit theorem, we can assume that the sample average is normally distributed. We're not given the population standard deviation here, so we have to estimate it from the data. And because we're using the sampled standard deviation, we know that Z will be t-distributed. So the only way to calculate the confidence interval bounds is to use this t-distribution for Z from the sample average. This imposes an additional assumption though, that the raw data are normally distributed. Pause the video and work ahead to check if that assumption is true. Using the QQ plot, we are now sure that the data are normal. If you didn't have access to a computer to create this plot, you would simply have to state that you assume it to be true and carry on. The next step is to calculate the other quantities to construct the confidence interval using the equation we derived in the prior video. Pause the video now and calculate the standard deviation and the critical values from the t-distribution. You should have found the standard deviation is 1.16. The critical T value at the 95% confidence level leaves 2.5% in each tail and it has 11 degrees of freedom associated with it. A value of 2.2 is a reasonable interpolation from the table. Or here is the code if you had used R. Substituting all our known values gives a lower bound of 13.9 and an upper bound of 15.4. To interpret this for our manager would be to say that the range from 13.9 to 15.4 has a 95% chance of containing the true viscosity from the batch process. If we took 100 groups of 12 samples, 95 of those groups would have calculated bounds that included the true viscosity. There is one problematic feature though with this problem of taking consecutive samples. In a batch process, unless we thoroughly clean out the batch between every run, we might have some carryover of material. This means that there could be a relationship between the samples. In practice, we would have to ensure that that is not the case. Data which are not independent can make this confidence interval bound wider than it needs to be or narrower than it really is. Which one it will be is dependent on how the data are related to each other. For the advanced students in the class, you might want to investigate this more on your own by trying this question and then reading the solution from the textbook. The key result is that lack of independence affects our confidence intervals, but in many cases the effect is not too bad.